Good morning. Welcome everyone to worship this morning. Um, we do have a few quick announcements before we get started. Uh, we will have kids group tonight at 5 o'clock. Um, then Wednesday we'll have Bible study at 6 o'clock. We'll be looking at the Lord's Supper, so it should be a good conversation. Um, also, uh, we're planning on taking a trip with young children and their families to Bon Clarkin at the end of uh, March to go see Bon Clarkin and see what it's like uh, for future camps and that. So if you'd like to be interested in going with that, uh, please let me know uh, so we can kind of get our plan solidified by that time. Um, other than that, that's all the uh, announcements uh, I have this morning. We enjoyed a, a week off last week. Hopefully everything was good. Mr. Alexander here with y'all. But uh, today we, we come and we worship our God and our King. And so even though it's dreary outside, we have every reason to praise. So let us begin our worship here today, so hearing our call to worship from our God from Psalm chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. Hear now God's word. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy and spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may exult in you. For you bless the righteous, O Lord, and cover him with favor as with a shield. Let's pray together. Our gracious God, we come before you here today, coming to give you the glory and honor, for you are our amazing God. You are our rock, you are our redeemer, you are our maker, our savior. You are the one that is everything to us. And here today, Lord, we come and we praise your holy name. And Lord, we pray that now in this time you would help us to come and to focus upon you. May this time be a time of rest from the world. A time to be comforted, to be encouraged, to be equipped. Lord, that you might rejuvenate us here today to go out into this fallen world and live for you. But Lord, in this time, may it be refreshing. And Lord, may you enable all that is done here today by our worship to be glorifying in your sight. Be with us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite everyone to stand together. Our first hymn this morning is found in the hymn book, number one, Praise Ye the Lord. lesson this morning comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. 
Hear now God's word. When the Son of Man comes in glory and all the angels with him, <clears throat> then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did you see a, we see a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you curse into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will, say, he will answer them, saying, Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. God's word for God's people. Amen. Let's pray together. Our gracious God, we come before you today and we come before you as sinners in need of grace. But Lord, as we look at ourselves, we see we're not perfect. We see that we fall through day in, day out. As we read your word, we see that we clearly do not keep it as we should. And so Lord, we come to you for grace. That which we do not deserve, we come to you, Christ, who out of his love and mercy came into this world to live, to die, to rise again for sinners like us. And Lord, we cling not to our own ability, but to Jesus. And we thank you that even in life's hardest moments, when you remind us that if we have Christ, Lord, you encourage us beyond all measure. To know that we have a God who loves us, who cares for us, who has saved us. And Lord, may we then seek to live for you. Lord, although we wish we could be perfect, we cannot. But we pray that you would help us day in and day out to honor you, to glorify you in our lives. Help us to stand out in this sinful world as those that show forth the light of Jesus. Lord, it may be with our neighbors. It may be with our friends. It may be with our co-workers. It may be in our community. It may even be in our own household. But Lord, help your light shine in us brighter and brighter each day as we seek to obey you as the one who has saved us. Lord, we come now and Lord, we pray for those that are in Ukraine. Lord, we see the violence that is being done and we pray that that violence would stop. Lord, may your powerful hand, who is above all rulers in this world, come and cause it to cease. May you keep those safe that are in the middle of it. May you enable those Christians there to continue to remember the hope they have in Christ, even in the face of death. May you uphold these people, encourage these people. And we pray that you would enable this conflict to stop. But ultimately, that you would see that this is not the perfect peace, but the perfect peace is only found in Jesus. And Lord, we pray that through this, even, you would see souls come to you. Then Lord, we pray that in our own church, we would say this, see the same thing happen. Through our ministry here in York, South Carolina, may you help us to reach out to those around us and show them Jesus. Show them the hope that we have and how we speak and how we live our lives honoring you. Lord, may our church here be a beacon of hope, a peace of joy of Jesus. And Lord, may you help us find more and more ways to do it. May you equip us, may you encourage us, and remind us that you are with us through it all. And Lord, we come here with so many other things upon our hearts here today. And Lord, we pray that you would answer them according to your will. And we take a moment to offer these things to you. 
in silent prayer. thank you that when we don't know what to pray we can always pray the prayer you taught your disciples pray our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite everyone to stand as we affirm our faith in the Apostles' Creed, which is found on page 12 of your hymn book. And again, we do this not out of routine, but we do this because this is the God in whom we believe. So I ask you, Christians, in whom do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe the Holy Ghost and the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. <clears throat> Amen. Now, if you remain standing, let's again sing together number 26, O Worship the King.
to come forward for the children's message. Y'all come sit up front. How are you guys? Good. So I have a question. What is that? A quarter. Now, what is a quarter? 25 cents. Money, right? Now, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to put this quarter in my hand, and if you can get my hand open, you can have that quarter. You want to try it? Yeah. Okay. You can keep trying. Do you think you can get it open? Oh, oh, they're double teaming. <laughs> nope. Looks like. Uh, oh, <laughs> she's not giving up. <laughs> All right. So, couldn't get it, could you? Here you go. Y'all can both have a quarter. Now, y'all couldn't snatch that quarter from my hand, right? No matter how hard you tried, you couldn't get it out. Did you know the Bible tells us that we are in Jesus' hand? And if we're in Jesus' hand, nothing can take us out of it. Nothing in this world, no body, no, 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 no bad situation, nothing. We are secure in his hand. Just like how tightly you held the Just how body. tightly I held the quarter, but even more so. And you know why that's such an encouragement? Because if we believe in Jesus, that means he saved us. And that means that no matter what happens... Nothing can take that salvation away. No matter if you get sick, no matter if something bad happens, if we have Jesus, nothing can take us out of that hand. And because of that, we can always look to that promise of eternal life, even when times get hard. And so the next time when something gets hard, remember this whole thing with the quarter, that no matter how hard life gets, if we have Jesus, nothing can take us out of his hand. Okay? Well, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that nothing else can take us out of your hand. We thank you for Jesus who has saved us and Lord, the hope that we can have in him. Lord, we pray that you would remind us even when life gets hard that you love us and that you're caring for us and nothing can take us away from you. And so Lord, help us then to love you more and live for you more, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, don't spend that all in one place. Y'all go sit down. <laughs> You know, if we had some older kids, I was going to worry if they can open my hand or not. <laughs> and also, there's only two, and I only had two quarters in my wallet. So, <laughs> uh, I invite you to turn with me in your copies of God's Word. Our scripture this morning comes from the book of John, chapter 10, uh, verses 22 through 42. Now, we pick up where we left off a couple weeks ago. Jesus had just talked about how he was the good shepherd. And here in our passage today, time has kind of sped up. Now the setting has changed, and Jesus is teaching in the temple. And we're told that it's wintertime during the Feast of Dedication. Now, you might not know what the Feast of Dedication is, but you might know it by a different name, which is called Hanukkah. Um, that festival that's uh, given to commemorate uh, the rededication and the cleansing of the temple after it was defiled by a man named Antiochus Epiphanes. Again, I'm not going to give you a history lesson there. You can look up it up more out of here, but that is the circumstance where we find Jesus here today. And instead of being out in the courtyard, it's cold, so Jesus is walking under the, the covered walkways around the temple, and he is teaching as he is walking. And it's in this passage that, as he's teaching, he again reveals just who he is. But also, he reveals to us just who we are. And so before we see that, let's go to him. Our Father and our God, we come before you again today thanking you for your word. Lord, it reveals to us the truth, your truth, where we come from, who you are, what we must believe, how we are to be saved, and then how we are to live. All we need in this life is found in your word. And so, Lord, today we pray that your spirit would open our hearts and our minds to receive your word of life. Lord, to encourage us, to convict us, to equip us, and help us live as those who have been saved by grace through Jesus. Lord, may you be with me now as I preach this. Lord, I am a, but a broken vessel. And may your spirit use me in spite of myself that these people be encouraged and lifted up and your name will be praised. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. In John chapter 10, verses 22 through 42, hear now the word of God. 
At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe, because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I have shown you many, many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, It's not for a good work that we're going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law? I said you were gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming, because I said I am the Son of God? If I am not doing the works of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. Again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. He went away again across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing at first, and there he remained. And many came to him, and they said, John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true. And many believed in him there. The grass withers, the flower fades, the word of the Lord endures forever. Amen. How many of you have ever come across a lost dog before? We have a Facebook group in our neighborhood where we see this kind of happening on occasion when there is a random dog that nobody knows who it is. So they're trying to figure out whose dog that, that dog, that person belongs to. Uh, sometimes it might happen. It might be in your yard. You might see this animal. It might be running around your neighborhood. Sometimes when we're out at the store, we might see a dog running around. And when you look at this dog, you can see, well, it's not a stray. It looks like it's well kept. And so it looks friendly. And so... You try to coax that dog over to try to see if there's any kind of identification of whose dog that is. Sometimes that's with a collar, where there's a number on it or where there's an address that you can take that dog to. And even if they don't have a collar, you can take the dog to the vet because in this day and age, we have microchips in animals that could tell you where that dog comes from. And if you really hit the jackpot, there might be a lost dog poster around that shows you exactly what that dog looks like and exactly who that dog belongs to. But whenever you don't have any of those things, it can bring you to a loss, can it? That's why it's so important for us, with our, even our own pets, to have something on them that IDs them as ours. Because without any kind of identification, who knows where that dog would come from? I say all this because this reminds us of the same truth between us and Christ. As we talked about a couple weeks ago, the Bible often refers to the people of God as his sheep, and Christ is the shepherd. But what is it about a Christian's life, what is it about your life that identifies you as Jesus' sheep? Now, we don't go around wearing dog collars, or we don't aren't microchip to tell us who we are. And as much as we wish that the Bible would have pictures of us in there, that if we were Jesus' sheep or not... That's not the case. So how can we tell if we are his? How can others tell if we are his? Well, thankfully here in our passage today, Jesus shows us a few ways to identify what his sheep look like. To indicate to ourselves and to others whose we are. And he does this in three different ways. First, he shows us that his sheep are those that hear and follow his voice. Then he says that his sheep are those that can have a security and comfort that is found nowhere else. And finally, to know if someone is his sheep, he shows us that his sheep are those that believe in him just as he says as he is. And so if you were to try to see today if you were Jesus' sheep or not, the first indicator we see here in this passage is that you hear and follow his voice. You see, Jesus is walking there at the Feast of Dedication around the temple. 
The crowds are there and they're pressing in on him. And they, they ask him, Jesus, tell us plainly here, how long are you going to keep us in suspense? Are you the Christ, are you the Messiah, the Savior, or not? Now, if you read the scriptures, Jesus had said that he was the Christ. But he had only did so privately to his disciples. He had yet to say that publicly. Because when people would hear of him being the Christ, they would misinterpret what he's saying. For they thought the Christ would come and deliver them from Rome. And so if Jesus told them that, they would take it completely the wrong way. And so Jesus had only told the disciples that he was the Christ. But Jesus had revealed that he was the Christ, maybe not in name, but in many other ways. And that's why Jesus answers them here in verse 25, essentially saying, I, I told you that already. I've shown you that I am the Son of God. I've shown you that I am the Son of Man, that I'm the bread of life, the living water, the light of the world. And yet you don't get it. You don't believe. You weren't listening. It kind of reminds me of me at home when earlier on in the day Amanda will tell me something and the day goes by and then I ask Amanda the same question that she already answered. And I get the response, were you not listening? No, I wasn't. And we see the same thing is true here with these Jews. Jesus had been showing them who he was, but they weren't listening. But it doesn't stop with just what he said. Also in his works, he had revealed to him just who he was. All the works that he says here that he did in the Father's name. Those works like healing the blind, like making the lame walk, like turning water into wine. He had done all these things, but yet they've seen them and still don't believe. And it makes us scratch our heads and say, you know, if we would have been there, we would have believed, right? Seeing Jesus do all of these things, we would have believed in what he said. Why didn't they? Well, Jesus actually answers that question here in verse number 26. Where he says, you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. Because Jesus' sheep, as he'll say here, are those that hear his voice and follow him. Now, I want you to notice something here. Jesus doesn't say that because they don't believe, then they're not his sheep. Jesus says instead that they don't believe because they're not his sheep. I know that sounds like a very minuscule thing, but essentially what that's saying is our faith in him is not what saves us. It's not what merits us to be saved. Faith in Jesus does save us. I said that wrong, but... It's not anything that we do on our end that makes us earn that. It's that he's already chosen us from the foundation of time as his sheep by his grace to bring us to faith that we believe. And so with that being the case, how do we know if we're his sheep or not? If he is the one that works in our hearts, how do we know then that we are his or not? Well, there might not be a physical marking on us, but Jesus does show us in here that certain markings that will show that we are his. And that is that we hear him and we follow him. You see, in Jesus' days, what they would do with the sheep is normally they would notch a sheep's ear. So when you see that sheep, that mark on their ear, you would know whose sheep they are. Well, for us, we might not have a physical notch, but there are certain markings. And the first marking is that there's a mark on our ear in the sense that we hear him and believe him. What you believe about God, what you believe about Christ, what you believe about the Bible reveals whose you are. If you think about that for a second, what do you believe? We just talked about the Apostles' Creed. We believe all of those things, right? That shows our faith. And so if we want to know if we're Jesus' sheep or not, we have to ask ourselves, what is it that I believe? Because if you're Jesus' sheep, you believe every word. You believe every word of his word. That's true. From the first letter of the book of, Re uh, book of Genesis to the last letter of the book of Revelation, you hold it as true and you believe it wholeheartedly. No matter what the world might believe, if you are Christ's sheep, 
You hear his voice and his word, and you listen, you believe. But that's not the only mark. There's another mark on our foot. That's how we follow him. But Jesus' disciples are called to follow him back in Matthew 4. All of his sheep today are called to follow him as well. And it reveals if we're, if we're his or not by how we follow him in our lives. How we live our lives shows if we are Christ's sheep or not. What does your life say about you? Do you strive to follow Jesus' example each and every day? Do you strive to live out your faith? Just as a sheep will walk in his shepherd's footsteps, so must you walk in Christ's footsteps. You know, it's one thing to talk the talk, but it's Jesus' sheep are those that walk the walk. There's got to be evidence in your life. You look back at that first scripture lesson. It reminds us that so many people today claim to be believers. They claim to be Christians, to be Christ's sheep. There's going to come a day whenever Christ is going to separate the sheep and the goats. And it's those that are sheep that are those that are going to be saved and the goats are not. Well, how do you know? Well, if you look at what Jesus explains, it's how they showed their faith in their life. They fed the hungry. They clothed the naked. They visited the sick, those in prison. Whereas the goats were those that did not. They did not do any of those things. Their profession of faith didn't find its way out of its life. And if you call yourself a sheep of Christ, your life has got to show it. There's got to be evidence of it. And how you love and care for others. Whether that's visiting them, whether that's helping them out, whether it's a kind word, a loving deed, whatever it is, if we call ourselves Christ's sheep, then there must be evidence of that faith in our life. For that is yet another mark of what it means to be his sheep. So we have to show it in what we believe, in our ears, and how we live, in our feet. Now I tell you that not to make you worry, but to really look at your life and see. Because if you're his sheep, that's how you ought to live. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He also shows us a more encouraging thing about if you're his sheep or not. Because his sheep are those that have comfort. But the second way to identify if you're Jesus' sheep or not is by the security and comfort you find in him. If you are a Christian, you have a comfort that can be found nowhere else. And here is why, as he shows us in verse number 28. He says, I give them, talking about his sheep, I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. If you are Jesus' sheep, if you have put your faith in Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you see quite clearly you have eternal life. Now, most of us know this is not talking about eternal physical life, because many of us know good saints that have, gone, have died and gone to be with the Lord. What this does tell us is that there is an eternal life guaranteed for his sheep after death when he returns again. An eternal life that you and I can look forward to. You know, we look at our life today, we might enjoy it, but our life is not perfect. There's still sickness, still disease. You or someone you know might have cancer. There's still hatred, there's still strife, there's still violence. You look at what's going on in Ukraine right now. The prime example of this world we live in is a fallen, broken world, far from perfect. But if you're Christ's sheep, and although this world might not be perfect, there's a comfort you can have in this eternal life that you find in Jesus. Because we can look forward to this, this life with him, that there's no more crying, there's no more sadness, there's no more pain, no more hardship, no more suffering, struggling, no more evil. No more sin. Just you enjoy it with Jesus forever. Oh, a wonderful thing that is. But what makes that even better is Jesus tells us here that his sheep will never perish. And again, this isn't saying we'll never die in this life. But that life that he gives us eternally will never go away. That's, as he says at the end here, that no one will snatch us out of his hand. Think about it for a second. 
what comfort we find in that. Because there's many people in the world that sadly believe that you can lose your salvation once you believe in Christ. But as we see here, this is, that's not possible. So as I showed the kids earlier, nothing can take us out of his kingdom. You know, R.C. Sproul puts it like this. There's a father and his three-year-old son, and you can kind of imagine me and Matthew now at Matthew's three. They're walking beside a railroad track. And the father can protect the son in two ways. One, he can tell the child, now, give me your hand and hold on to me, because if you let go, you'll fall and you'll get hurt. Or, the father can say, now, son, I'm going to grab your hand. And the father can grab him and say, now, I'm going to hold on to you to ensure that nothing happens to you. Which of those two methods do you think is the more secure? I would think we'd say the father holding on to the son. If we think about us in Christ, if you're his sheep, no one can snatch you from his hand. Not because of the grip you have on Jesus, but because of the grip he has on you. What a comfort there is in that. But the comfort doesn't stop there. It continues to grow. If you look at verse number 29, Jesus also tells us that my father who has given them, talking about the sheep, given them to me, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. Not only does Jesus have his sheep in his hand, but if you were his sheep, you were also in the Father's hand as well. And if you were in the Father's hand, as Jesus reminds us here, who is greater than all, then you're secure. Because who can steal from God? No one. And so if you are Christ's sheep, you are secure, and nothing can take you away from him. See, that's why Jesus tells us here that he and the Father are one. Yes, that does have a little bit to say about the Trinity. We'll get to that in just a minute. But what we see here is that both Jesus and the Father have the exact same will and purpose to hold on to the sheep no matter what. So that we can know if we are his sheep, that as Romans says, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. Think about that again. Nothing can take you away from God. Not time, because it has no effect on God, because he made it. Not death, because God is the maker and giver of life. Not sin, because God has defeated sin on the cross of the Lord Jesus and given us hope by rising again. Not any worldly powers, any kings, presidents, dictators. I saw something this morning talking about Ukraine, about how there was this one woman in Kiev. And while the Russians are moving in, there she is at St. Michael's Cathedral, standing at this, this mural, holding up her hands and praying. While everybody else is going about the business, here she stands, praying to her God. What a reminder that no matter what's going on in the world, our God is greater. He can take care of our problems. He can deliver us. But ultimately, no matter what goes on in this world, we can know that we're secure in his hand, no matter what the world may do. Not even Satan, as much as he would try, can take us out of God's hands. And not even ourselves in our foolish, sinful, rebellious ways. How many times have we struggled and fallen into sin time and time again? But not even we ourselves can take us out of God's hands. And if that's the case, if you're his sheep, then you can live with the security and the comfort in this life like no one else has. It's very easy to fall into fear, but this reminds us that if we are Jesus' sheep, we're in his hands. And nothing can take that away. You know, the world we live in often, when they call a person a sheep, it's a negative thing. Here you have this person who kind of goes with the hurt mentality that's easy to do, you know, doesn't really pay attention that you can kind of bend them to and fro to whatever your will is. They don't think for themselves. But as Christians, when we're called sheep, we can know that that's actually not a negative thing. Because that means that while the world worries and fears, we're able to rest securely and comfortably in our God's hands. And sometimes we forget that, but Jesus reminds us that if we're his, just as he'll take care of the birds of the air and the flowers of the field, he'll take care of you. 
And that should enable us to live differently than the rest of the world. To stand out. Because our shepherd holds us tight. But there is one more way to identify if you're Jesus' sheep or not. And that's that Christ's sheep are those that believe in him as he says he is. Now I know we talked about at the beginning of this that Jesus' sheep are those that hear his voice and believe his word. But this part particularly deals with what you believe about the person of Jesus Christ himself. Because everything hinges upon that. Jesus had said he and the Father are one. But we're told here the Jews don't like that. They pick up stones to kill him. But Jesus, instead of backing away, he responds to them by appealing to the miracles that he had did. He said, well, now which of these good works that I did in my Father's name, the healing and the caring for people, these things that are clearly from God, are you going to stone me for? But without batting an eyelash, it seems, they ignored what Jesus just said. They said, we're going to stone you because you blasphemed. Because you said that you were God. Being man, you made yourself God. Now, you see the irony in that statement here? Being man, you made yourself God. Because the truth is quite the opposite, isn't it? Being God, he made himself man. To come and to save us. And so the Jews here think that they have got Jesus right where they want, legally. He said that he's God. Now they can finally kill him. Because the problem with the Jews is they didn't want to believe who Jesus said he was. They saw him as an enemy, they saw him as a threat, and so they wanted to get rid of him. But notice what Jesus does here. This little ending part can seem a little clunky and confusing, but we'll walk through it. For Jesus answers them, Is it not written in your law, I said you are gods? And what Jesus is doing here is he's pointing back to the Old Testament, which these Jews should have known well, to Psalm number 82, verse 6, where this is God speaking. He says, I said you are gods, little g, sons of the Most High, all of you. And in that... God is not talking about himself. He's talking about those that he has appointed to carry out his word, to look after the people, to do what God has commanded them to do. That's what Jesus says here. If he called them gods to whom the word, the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, essentially saying you can't just toss this out, then do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, say that you're blaspheming? Because I said I'm the Son of God. Essentially what Jesus is saying here is you have these men of old who God called God because they were called to do what he called them to do. But yet, if you read in that psalm, they actually fail. They don't do what God commands. Here you're saying that while God called these failures gods, here I am the one that has been consecrated, set aside by God the Father and come into the world to save you're trying to stone me for saying I'm the Son of God. Essentially what Jesus has done is he has found a legal loophole here. That now they can't do anything to him. But the fact remains that while they can't do anything for saying that he's a Son of God, both they know and Jesus knows exactly what he was saying. Jesus was saying that he is indeed divine. He is God himself. He's, he is this Christ. He is the Messiah come into the world to die to, for the sins of his sheep. So if we would believe in him, we would be saved and find forgiveness and life in his name. And that's quite clear to these people. That should be clear to everyone here in this world today. Jesus Christ is the Savior. He is the Messiah. We are all sinners, and Jesus is the only way to be forgiven of your sins. And that is why you and I must believe in him, not who we think he is. We believe in him for who he says he is in his word. We can't be like the Jews. We can't reject him. Because all the evidence that we've already talked about is right in front of them. That's why Jesus says as he does here at the end. He says, if I am not doing the works of my father, then don't believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works. That you may know and understand that the father is in me and I am the father. Essentially what Jesus is saying here is, look, if I just said I was the Son of God, you don't have to believe me. 
to look at what I've been doing that shows that I am the Son of God. It's like if somebody came up to you and said, well, I, I'm an amazing basketball player. You look at them and say, okay. But then when they actually get on the court and make every single shot from all over the place, then you can see by the actions they took, they are indeed who they said they were. The same thing is true for Jesus. Jesus is saying, look, if you don't believe what I say, look what I do. And I'll show you who I truly am. Healing the blind. Healing the lame, as we see later on, rising again from the grave on the third day. These are things that only Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, can do. So when he says that he and the Father are one, he is showing us he is God himself in the flesh. That he is in the Father, the Father is in him. And you would hope and you would think that the Jews would listen, but they don't. They seek to stone him again. So Jesus withdraws and goes across the Jordan River. But thankfully, across the river, there are those that do believe. And you see, that belief is the difference between Jesus' sheep and those that are not his sheep. For Christ's sheep are those that believe him for just who he says that he is. That he is the Son of God come to save. And if you're his sheep, then that's who you should be trusting in. Jesus is not just simply some good moral teacher. He's not some historical figure who did a lot of good. He is the Son of God. He is God in the flesh, who is the only way for you to be saved. The world doesn't want to hear that, but if you're his sheep, you must believe. No matter what everyone else says, Christ's sheep are those that are not afraid to stand out because they believe exactly who Jesus says that he is. That he and the Father are one, that he is the Christ come to save sinners, and that if you and I have believed in him, we have eternal life that can never be taken away. As we close this morning, I have to ask you the question, do you believe that? If you want to know if you are Jesus' sheep or not, the answer must be yes. Well, it's true, you can hear and follow him in your life. You can have a comfort in him. All of that hinges upon if you have trusted in Jesus Christ as he revealed himself in his word. Believing in him, not what the world says that he is. Believing in him, not as the other churches who have abandoned the Bible say that he is. But believing who he says he is revealed in the holy scriptures of God. And if you believe that, then you can know that you're his sheep. And doing that, then you can seek to live your life hearing him and following him. And finding a comfort and security that can be found nowhere else because you are in his hands. So may this passage here today reveal to all of you if you're his sheep or not. If not, this is a perfect time to put your faith in him. And if so, may this be a reminder to you of the comfort you can have in your shepherd. That you are his. And a challenge that he might use you in your life. To show those around you just whose it is that you are. May the world look at us and may they see a sheep that belongs to the good shepherd. We pray to God. Our great God, we come before you today. Lord, we thank you for the salvation we find in Jesus Christ. As you have taken people like us and brought us into your flock. And Lord, I pray that each of us here would show forth that we are your sheep. Lord, when people see us, they would see the things that identify that we are yours and how we live this life for you and how we share with others your truth and what we believe. Lord, may you help us to be those that have a comfort beyond all comfort in this world for we are secure in your hands. Lord, what a blessing it is that we are yours. And Lord, may we all here today Believe in you for who you say you are. Our great shepherd who has come to save us. And Lord, then may you use us in our lives to show others who you are. So they too should be part of your flock. Lord, help us, encourage us then as your sheep to go out into this world, to hear you, to follow you. And to 
show the others just how wonderful a shepherd you are. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand together. Our final hymn this morning is number 84, I Sing the Mighty Power of God. countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. May the peace